Come on, Fuse, make some noise. Hey, I don't, I don't even feel like I need to preface it too much, but there's a little thing next week, and you, if you are fired up for Gauntlet on the count of three all across the state, I need you to make some noise, all right? One, two, three. <clears throat> hey, we, we've been talking about this thing for, for a real long time, and I just can't wait for one big family reunion. And uh, if this is your first time at Fuse, uh, we are so glad that you're here. Can we make some noise for all of our friends if it's their first time across the state? We're glad you're here. And uh, tonight's kind of a special night on twofold. We are, are really excited about the gauntlet, and I'm gonna share a word that I hope will encourage us. And if you didn't get the chance to sign up for the gauntlet, I still believe it's gonna encourage you around to have the best summer of your life. But I wanted to take a moment really quickly. Uh, if you're a senior across the state, could you please stand to your feet? And let's make some noise for all of our seniors. We love you guys. We're so proud of you. It's uh, your last Wednesday night at Fuse, and I just wanna say on behalf of the Fuse, stay standing, stay standing. Uh, we are so proud of every single one of you. Our goal is that we wanna see you graduate into a lifetime of following Jesus, and uh, we're just so proud of you on these days ahead. And uh, while you're standing, can all the Fuse group leaders of any seniors please stand up? We wanna honor you and celebrate all the Fuse group leaders. You guys are heroes. You guys are the real deal. That This is a big family affair and uh, this is a special night tonight. I hope you feel honored and uh, also know that we can't wait to celebrate with you at the gauntlet so you can take your seat and let's lean in for a great night. But I've got some tips, say tips. Tips, tips on how to have the best gauntlet, okay? You're allowed to get your phone out for this. 10 tips on how to have the best gauntlet. Take a photo, real quick. Take a photo, take a photo, take a photo. Tip number one is this, say drink water. Stay hydrated. I don't want any of you fainting. Like, I need you to stay hydrated. Tip number two is be kind to your leader. Leaders say amen. amen. Your leaders are heroes. They're amazing. Be kind. And listen, listen to them, because I ain't afraid to send you home, all right? So make sure you listen to them. Honor them. Third one is this. Say, don't complain. No one wants that. The fourth one is this, is that you will survive without your phone, okay? So get your mind right. I'm just telling you. For centuries we've done it without phones and you can survive a few days. And I promise you, by the end of it, you might say, this is amazing. I've really enjoyed not having my phone. That was a tip from Justin Harrison. Here's another one. Make new friends. Say, I want friends. <laughs> Literally, thousands of people are all coming to Clemson, South Carolina. I wanna challenge you. Make friends with someone from another campus. Come say hello to me. I'll be at the volleyball court just dominating Grant Sugar and the Aiken boys. I'll be at the basketball court dominating everyone. Just come and make friends. Enjoy community groups. You'll get to meet people from different campuses. It's gonna be amazing. This is another one. Say, come to prayer time. Every morning we're gonna have a time of prayer, kind of if you came to 21 Days of Prayer, 7.30, your leader will know where it is. Come and be a part of it during your quiet time. Uh, four quick ones, be honest and vulnerable in your groups. You're gonna meet people, dive in, be ready to go for conversations. Take notes like I know you're doing tonight and come ready to go and buckle up. Say, buckle up. Buckle up. I'm telling you, it's gonna be a great time and so tonight, my goal uh, is to really get us full of expectation for what God's gonna do at the gauntlet. And just disclaimer, I'm gonna talk a lot about the gauntlet tonight. But again, if you're not going to the gauntlet, I still believe there's something for you that you can have the best summer of your life. And so if you're taking notes tonight, which I encourage you to do, no one's distracting, no one's talking to anyone, we're dialed in. This is what I want you to write down as the notes for the topic of, of tonight is God, I want you. God, I want you. I remember as a 14 year old going to a summer camp like what you're about to go to and I was standing in worship. I remember the exact place where I stood on the carpet and I remembered so distinctly having an encounter with God that radically changed my life. I came there to have a good time with my friends. I came there to make some memories but I remember the presence of God getting a hold of me where I went away to a distraction-free environment with my friends and God's presence were there. And I'm telling you, as a nearly 30-year-old man, it has still marked me to this day. And my prayer for every single one of you is that next week, God is gonna do something in you. It might be in community groups. It might be in your fuse group. It might be walking down the road. I just know that there's something that God has for every single one of you. And I just pray, our simple prayer would be this, that God I want you. 
But the question that we're gonna wrestle through tonight, which I think it's sometimes easy to say, I want you, but life can hit us in different ways and it doesn't always feel like, quote unquote, I want you. Like we're trying to follow God, but there's so many things and distractions around us. And I wanna get around this one question tonight. And the question is this, is how do you cultivate a hunger, say hunger, for God? How do you cultivate a hunger for God? God, that you're going about your life, but how do you get within you, man, I want to be hungry for you, God. You might be thinking, man, it's easy for you, six foot six Australian guys screaming at me on a screen or hearing Anderson to say, I want you, God, because you're the preacher. But no, I can find in my life difficult times, things that I walk through where it's hard to quote unquote want to follow Jesus, but I've just learned there's some ways that can cultivate hunger for the things of God. And I pray that tonight you would feel a sense of, man, I fall more in love with Jesus by the end of the night. I want more of you, God, by the end of tonight, no matter where you're at in life. So the text that we're gonna look at tonight uh, is is specifically uh, Matthew chapter nine. You can go there if you've got your Bibles, Matthew chapter nine. But I wanna read this one verse to us as well. It's in Matthew chapter five, verse six. It says this, this is Jesus speaking. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Say filled. Matthew chapter nine, this is where we're gonna be for the majority of tonight. We're gonna kind of say, we're going on a journey. We're going on a journey tonight, all right? We're gonna kind of walk through this chapter together and I wanna pull out some themes that I see uh, in this chapter. And this is the first couple verses that I wanna look at that it says this. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast. I wanna unpack this to us tonight, but before we do, let's pray. God, we want you. That's the cry of our heart, God, is that we want more of you. And I pray that tonight we would see you clearer and that you would speak. I... uh, Amen, sorry, I forgot to say amen. That's very important for a prayer. You guys would have kept your head, head bowed. I was already ready off and away, you know what I mean? Never cease praying, all right? So, uh, I, 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 does anyone like to eat? That was the most lame response ever. Do you like to eat? Come on, baby, I, lo- I love to eat. I, uh, I, 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 yell at me some of your favorite foods. I love to hear it always. Okay. All right, all right. My, my, one of my favorite things about when I moved to America uh, in 2017 was I learned that Americans love to eat. But not only do they love to eat, they love to eat a lots of food. Like I remember as an Aussie coming to this country, like the portions were big. There was just so much food on offer and the menu. Like there's just all, I'm like, this is heaven. Like I'm loving the abundance in this place. Well, uh, one thing I learned was about this place called Olive Garden. Has anyone ever heard of Olive Garden out there? Well, it had these, these like reputation that I just had to go. Well, I went to Olive Garden and, and I found these beautiful things called breadsticks. Make some noise for Chase, my waiter. Look at this guy, get a camera shot. Just, just look at the camera, look at the camera. And my waiter brought me these beautiful breadsticks. Chase, just eat that for me right there. Oh, beautiful Chase. It's, it's beautiful, isn't it? Chase wasn't ready for this. He said, I've got gum in my mouth. Make some noise for Chase, everyone. I, uh, I remember my first time having this breadstick and uh, who loves just the Olive Garden breadsticks? Come on, these guys were up here want some breadsticks. These guys. Yeah, all right, enough, enough, enough. I'm not throwing out anymore, I'm not throwing out anymore. All right, I remember this moment. They brought, they brought the breadsticks to me and I was just ready. It smelled good. Oh, it smells good. I remember the first taste. Oh, it was beautiful. It's so good. And I'm there on a date with Taylor, like, babe, it's so amazing, we just moved to America. Look at all this bread. That was amazing. I drink a little bit of Coke. Cody, I'm gonna need the water up here, please, because uh, I'm gonna die up here. I remember a Coke. I'm not only drinking a Coke, but you get free refills in America. It's like, that's amazing. In Australia, you gotta pay $3.50 every time you want a Coke. And so, I know, it's, it's, it's horrific, but pray for us. I put a lot of bread in my mouth. I'm trying to talk. I remember eating this bread. I just kept eating it, like piece after piece after piece, threw it out here, it's all going away. I'm eating all this bread, I just can't stop, you know what I mean? 
And then my waiter, Chase, comes to the, comes to the, to the table again with the main meal. <clears throat> Make some noise for Chase again. Wow, it's delicious. Do you, do you, do you wanna eat that? You got it. <laughs> he said, I got it. Look at this, just beautiful meatballs. Just here, Chase, have a little bite, have a little bite. That's beautiful. Mm. This guy's got big muscles, you need to get the protein. But I remember, thank you, that, that's beautiful, thank you, thank you. I remember uh, this moment where the, the, the main comes to the, to the stage, to the stage, I wasn't on a stage at Olive Garden, and I'm like, bro, Taylor, I can't eat it. Like, I've had so much bread that I can't eat the main. Like, I, I am a huge human being, I've had so much bread, like I'm in heaven, I don't know how I'm gonna eat these spaghetti meatballs. And I'm thinking about like, babe, what am I gonna do? And I was thinking about this uh, in the lead up to this message because I think this is how we live life. So often, uh, we long for certain things in life and we just keep eating. We eat the things of this world, we have a longing and an appetite for it, but we miss the true thing that we were made for of substance and life the main meal, the main feast of God. We, we come along and get the breadstick of comfort. And we eat it and we nibble away and we're just like, man, I just want a comfortable life. Like we desire a comfortable life. If I can just kind of live it easy, only those certain people that I'm friends with, I don't wanna make many more friends. I've kind of found a comfortable way to live. I don't want much risk to my life. We wanna eat the breadstick of comfort. Maybe another breadstick that we eat is of relationships. Like if I can just get with this person or if they can tell me I look good, if I can get a compliment for her or a compliment from him, I will just feel good. That we find the breadsticks of love. Maybe it's the breadstick of money. Maybe it's the thing that it's like, man, if I can just get the new shoes, like if I can just get that new possession, that thing that I want. I remember as a teenager in the prehistoric days when, when laptops weren't really a thing but they were becoming a thing, uh, this is like early 2000s, I was begging my parents to get me a laptop. I, I learned about a laptop and they were so big and heavy, like if I brought one on stage, it could kill someone, so heavy and big. And I remember pleading with them like, please get me a laptop. And as I was pleading with them for a laptop, I wrote them a note like, hey, I'll clean my bedroom every day. I'll do the dishes every single day. I'll mop and sweep the floors. I'll save up some money too. Like, please get me a, a laptop. One day, miraculously, the laptop appears. But I don't know if you've ever found this. It feels good for a few days, maybe a few weeks, a few months. But time goes by and I don't really care about it anymore. And I didn't do what I said I'd do in the letter. There are things in life that we chase after, that we eat of, but it doesn't truly satisfy us. Have you ever felt that? That you feel like, man, I, I quote unquote want to follow you, God, but I don't know if I can actually fit that much more in me. Well, tonight what I wanna do is help us cultivate a hunger for God. That Jesus said this in Matthew chapter four, that man shall not live on bread alone, but on the every word that comes from my mouth. Another way to say it like this, C.S. Lewis writes that I find myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy. The most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Have you ever found that like you chase experiences in the world but it doesn't truly satisfy? Have you ever done something that you thought maybe this is it but it doesn't actually satisfy you? Could it be that you were made for another world and there is only one person that you can find true satisfaction in and his name is Jesus? And so for the next few moments, what we're gonna do is unpack this idea of, okay, I get it, like I wanna be satisfied on the main meal. I want you, Jesus, but how do I cultivate hunger in my life? The first thing that I observe in this text that we're gonna journey through in Matthew 9 in that first few verses that we read of is this is that we need to look for hunger over apathy. Hunger over apathy. The spiritual hunger comes through surrender. And fasting is a spiritual weapon and it's saying to God, you can have my whole being. So in this text, what we read about, and I'm gonna really speak to this for a few moments, then we're gonna keep moving and you can have conversations with this with your leaders, is there is a practice that Jesus teaches 
around this idea of fasting. Give me a wave if you've ever heard of this idea of fasting. Okay, some of you. Fasting is this idea of, I wanna put a definition before you, is fasting is going without food and giving yourself fully to God. Going without food and giving yourself fully to God. This has been done throughout the centuries through church history. Uh, the, the disciples of John are asking Jesus, hey, why aren't your disciples fasting right now? And Jesus says, hey, they're with me right now, but I'm gonna go, and when I go, they will fast. And what this does is it cultivates hunger within us for the things of God. Now, I wanna put a disclaimer out there, and this is a very serious and sensitive topic, that some of you battle with an eating disorder. And I wanna be very conscious of this, is that, this may be not a practice for you to participate in. And I want you to know that God loves you, He sees you, and I would encourage you to be open and honest with your leader and your parents and, and know that we care for you and this is a safe place for you. But for us tonight, this idea of fasting is like a spiritual weapon that can cultivate within us hunger for God, simply going without and saying, God, I am Yours, and so I wanna put before you really quickly, and we're gonna keep moving, is uh, what does it do? Let's look at what does it do. Three things, it starves the flesh, it reveals our dependence, and it amplifies our prayers. It starves the flesh, it, uh, it feeds the spirit, it reveals our dependence and amplifies our prayers. What this does, this idea of fasting, imagine this. You go, I remember my first time as a teenager trying this. I did it for like, I skipped lunch and breakfast. My, my youth group were doing it. And I, I was struggling, bro. I was like, I'm a growing man. I need to eat my food. I can't do this. But while I'm there and I'm, I simply skip breakfast, skip lunch, and then I had the best dinner ever. But it was this idea that I'm saying, I'm going without, and by the end of the day, man, I could feel my soul coming alive. That it, it, what it does is it says, hey, no to the flesh, and yes to things of you, God, that I'm dependent upon you, and I need you. So how, how do you do it? How do you do it? This is the next part. Jesus says that in this text, he says, then they will fast. It is an assumed practice that this is so not talked about in modern church these days, but really for the, the church up until the 17th century, they did this two times a week. But we barely hear about it, but this is something that God, God has given us as a gift to cultivate hunger. And the second one is this is that simply, skip a meal and say, God, I'm using this time in prayer and in the Word. So we're gonna keep moving now in this journey that we're going through uh, this text. And I want you to encourage you to talk about fasting with, with your fuse group. That's a spiritual practice you can do. But the journey goes on, and the second theme that I see in this chapter is around faith and com over complacency. Faith over complacency. Faith over complacency. Let's read uh, the next verse. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him. So he's teaching about fasting, and a man comes up and kneels before him. And he says, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. This is a moment where Jesus is teaching in Matthew chapter nine about fasting and this man appears to him. And he says, hey, Jesus, my daughter has just died but if you lay your hand on her, she will live. And what I see in this is a man who has the faith to believe that Jesus could bring her daughter back from death. That there was two options on the table for this man is that he could have been complacent. That he could have said, man, I did all I did, could have done. That I got the doctors. I went and sought after counsel. I thought about what could else could I do. And I've just settled in myself that this is my fate. He could have been complacent and just settled with it. But he has the faith to believe that I've heard about Jesus. I've seen the miracles. And I just believe that he could bring my daughter back from life if he lays her hand on her. And this is something for us that I wanna stir within us if we wanna have a life of hunger for God. Would you not be complacent, Fuse? Would you not just settle that, man, I've heard about Jesus, but I'm gonna stay over here? Would you have the faith, the assurance of things unseen, the confidence that God could move? 
You don't just believe in some fictional fairy tale God, but you actually have the faith to believe, God, would you move? What's the thing that you need faith for right now? What's the thing that you're praying and believing for? This man is in a horrific situation, but his despair, the challenge that he's walking through cultivates within him to say, I'm gonna have the faith to believe. When it comes to the goal, what are you coming in with? What's the thing that you're walking through right now? The sickness in your family, the confusion about the future, the difficulty in relationships, whatever it might be, don't just settle back, settle back and be complacent, but say, hey, God, I'm coming by faith, believing. Next week in Clemson, you are gonna be there and you're gonna move and miracles can take place. Would faith rise within fuse? No matter what you're going through, no matter what your circumstances look like, will we have the faith to believe in a God who can redeem and restore? The second theme that I see in this passage of Scripture is desperation over comfort. Desperation over comfort. As the story goes on, Jesus gets up and he says, I'll go, come and heal. There's a lady who who's appears on the scene. And it says this, and behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up from him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. And Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, my daughter, your faith has made you well. Here's another lady who appears on the scene who is a little bit desperate that for 12 years she's battled with a sickness. She's gone to the doctors, she spent all her money. By the rituals of the day, she was ceremonially unclean, but she thinks Jesus is here. I see him. And I just have the faith to believe and I'm desperate that if I just touch the hem of his garment, I could be healed. And this lady works her way through the crowd and doesn't matter what people would think, doesn't matter about her sickness and thinks, I just need to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. She's desperate for Jesus. And through her desperation, she comes before the living Saviour. And the living Saviour would look at her and say, daughter, your faith has made you well. She doesn't settle for the comfort of her circumstances, the things that she's so used to, this issue that she's battled with for years, but she's desperate. And I just wanna ask you, are you desperate for God? It's so easy to get comfortable. It's so easy to just kind of get used to life and the things that we're walking through and the things we're going through and just kind of settle for what it is. But I wanna be a person who's desperate for God. And when you're desperate, miracles take place. When you're desperate, He'll meet you right where you're at. And this lady has an encounter that He looks at her in all, of her, all that she's walked through and sees a woman who's been desperate for Him and her faith has made her well. What are you desperate for? What's the thing that you're praying for and believing for? Don't just settle for the comforts of this world. Keep your eyes on the one who can work and redeem and restore. And this story would go on, that he's had an exchange with a man whose daughter has passed away and he says, hey, I believe if you come and lay your hand on her, she will live. And as Jesus gets up to go, this lady reaches out and touches the hem of his garment and she is healed. And Jesus then continues on the journey with this ruler and let's look what happens next. And Jesus came to the ruler's house and he saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion. And he said, go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in. He took her by the hand and the girl arose. And the report of this went throughout all the district. Jesus comes up and there's this crowd of people who have already begun the morning. He says, hey, get out of here. They laugh at him. And Jesus enters the room where death 
is. He reaches out, he grabs this girl, and she lives. This is a picture of what Jesus does. Dead things back to life. He takes our brokenness, our sin, and he redeems and he restores. Jesus will go to the ultimate depth of death, entering a tomb, himself dying, but three days coming out of the grave alive and well, and came to give you and I hope. This is our Savior. And this is the moment that I look at and think about and I've been praying for you, Fuse, that what would us, what would this community of faith look like if we said, hey, we're gonna hunger for God over being apathetic, if we're gonna live by faith rather than being complacent, that we're gonna be desperate for God over settling for the comforts of the world. What could take place? What could take place next week when thousands of people come to Clemson? From the first moment you arrive, maybe on the bus, one of you are gonna give your life to Jesus. From when you get step foot on the, on the campus at, uh, at Clemson, I've been praying this, that you would feel like it's a refuge. No matter what you've been going through at home, the divorce your parents are going through, the sickness, it's like this safe place of refuge. What could take place if it's teenagers are saying, oh God, I'm desperate for you that heaven could collide with earth, that while you're there, miracles take place. That you find a rich sense of community that you've never experienced before. But not only that, what could take place if you say, hey God, I wanna live by faith. I wanna live desperate for you. What will your family look like? What will your school look like? What will your friendships look like? What would the state of South Carolina look like if thousands of teenagers say, God, I'm hungry for you. God, I want you. Even though my family's going through the sickness right now, I want you. God, I want you right now. My friend's dad just passed away. I don't know what to say, but I want you and need you. God, the depression that I've been walking through and carrying, God, I want you. You, I don't want the bread of this life, the things that this world has to offer, the money, the comfort, the relationships. I don't want these things because they don't satisfy. You are the one who satisfies. Psalm 63, it says this, that, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. And my flesh, it faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. This is David riding out in difficulty and heartache. He said, God, I need you. My flesh, it faints for you. My soul, it thirsts for you. Look at this. So I've looked up in the sanctuary and beholding your power and glory because your steadfast love is better than life and my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. Would that be us for you, that we will bless God as long as we live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. And this is the verse that I wanted us to see that my soul will be satisfied as if with fat and rich foods. And my mouth will praise you with joyful lips that the world will try and satisfy you with momentary pleasures, but it is God alone, the one that will satisfy you. And I promise you, when you get in the presence of God at Gauntlet, it's gonna be amazing and change your life. But you can meet with Him in your car, you can meet with Him in your bedroom, you can meet with Him wherever you are, the best summer of your life, because I'm telling you this, in great despair, last week, I was feeling anxious, I was feeling worried. I was in my bed, rolling over, just worried about some things going on in my life. And I got out of my bed 11 o'clock at night and just turned on my worship music and started praying this, this psalm. God, it is you alone that satisfies. I start praying and being in His presence and realize this is what I want. This is what I want, not what the world has to offer. It is you alone who satisfies. Skipping down to verse eight, that my soul clings to you, your right hand upholds you. 
would that be our posture that it is you alone, God, that I'll cling to? A very simple message for us tonight, but I pray if anything, it cultivates within us a hunger for God, for the things of God. And I just wanna ask really quickly, would you bow your heads and close your eyes and we're gonna enter into a time of response right now. And I just wonder, maybe you're, you're here for the first time or you've been here a long time, but you've heard me talk and Maybe you've heard about God or Jesus, but you don't actually know Him. And we would love to give you an opportunity to know Him. We're not gonna point you out or embarrass you, but I'm just gonna ask on the count of three, would you raise your hand as a sign of faith? And so I know I can pray for you and leaders would love to pray with you. So if that's you tonight, you wanna have a relationship with Jesus on the count of three, would you raise your hand? Friend, He loves you, he paid the ultimate price for you by coming from heaven to earth and living the perfect life and dying upon a cross and taking the sin and the brokenness of the world, going to the tomb and defeating death and is alive today. You simply have to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that he is Lord and you will be saved. So if that's you tonight, you want a relationship with Jesus, would you raise your hand on the count of three? One, two, three. It's awesome. There's people reaching out their hand in this room. Leaders, if you see someone with a hand raised, would you go and have a conversation with them all, all across the state? It's amazing, it never goes old, heaven's applauding. It's awesome. And for the rest of us, I just wanna really quickly lead us through three simple questions that I want you to reflect on. And if you even have your journal, you can maybe even write a response down if you want. This is in the lead up to the gauntlet and this, and this summer. This is the first question, we'll put it on the screen. Is, what are you specifically asking God to do at Gauntlet this summer? What are you specifically, maybe there's one thing. What's that one thing? Hey God, would you do this? They've been really struggling here or I wanna see you move in a friend or something. What's that one thing specifically asking God to do at Gauntlet or this summer? Take a moment and just write that down. Next question. Who are you specifically praying for at Gauntlet this summer? Maybe it's someone in your group. Maybe it's for your dad, for your mom. Maybe it's for an uncle, someone who's not coming to the Gauntlet. What are you praying that God might do in and through your time there in this summer? next question is this. What are you desperate for God to do in your life and community? What is it? What's that thing? You don't have to hide it. You don't have to think God cares about everyone else and He doesn't care about me. It's too little or it's too big. What is it? And I want to challenge you, be praying over that this next week. But right now, I believe God wants to speak to you in this moment. So I'm gonna pray for us and we're gonna respond. God, I thank you for all that you're doing in and through Fuse, God. I, I am just so deeply proud of all these students across the state. God, I love you so much and we love you and we want you, God. We don't want the things of this world. We don't want the bread of the world. We want you. You are sweeter than life. And so God, I pray tonight, would you meet us would you give us the boldness to come before you desperately and full of faith? And I bless every single student in Jesus' name, amen.